For many years, Africa has been ruled by dictators, doctors of 10 size power commonly in their late 50s, 60s, or even 70s. A clear example being President Teodoro Obiang Nguima, the president of Equatorial Guinea, who has been in power for 44 years, enough to hide the only instance where there was a difference. A difference that will surprise but also inform you of the possibility to make a change in Africa. Without much ado, meet Valentine Strasser, a young man from Sierra Leone, who made history by becoming the country's youngest head of state. Before we continue, please subscribe to our channel for more exciting content. Born on April 26, 1967, in the capital city of Freetown, Strasser grew up in the Allentown neighborhood. At the age of 18, he completed his education at Sierra Leone Grammar School, where he excelled in subjects like mathematics and chemistry. After finishing secondary school in 1985, Strasser joined the Republic of Sierra Leone Military Forces RSLNF, under President Siaka Stevens. Despite holding a junior rank, he embarked on a remarkable journey that would change his life. Through a series of events, Strasser seized power and assumed the role of president at the age of 25, resembling the kind of leader we often see in movies. During his tenure as president, which lasted for four years, Strasser adopted the demeanor of a dictator. He attended meetings, donned suits, and implemented policies. However, his reign came to a shocking end. If you're curious about the details of his rise to power, watch the video, where we explore how a young soldier managed to seize control and become the president of Sierra Leone. Valentine Strasser underwent military training at the Benjma Military Training Academy near Freetown. After completing his training, he achieved an extraordinary accomplishment at the age of 19 by becoming a commission officer in the Sierra Leone Army. He was stationed at a military barracks in Daru, located in the eastern part of Sierra Leone. In 1991, the Revolutionary United Front, RUF, led by Fodes Sanko, launched its first attack in the Kalahun district. Strasser, along with other soldiers already stationed there, was assigned the task of countering the rebellion. He actively fought against the Liberian invasion in Sierra Leone, particularly in the eastern and southern regions, battling both domestic rebels and the RUF. President Momo, who came before Strasser, faced criticism for failing to address the demands of the Sierra Leonean people. The population desired a more cooperative political system, feeling that Momo had not brought about significant changes from his predecessor. Sierra Leone had experienced corruption and mismanagement under both Momo and Siaka Stevens. In 1991, the Sierra Leone Civil War erupted, pitting the government against the invading RUF. Government soldiers on the front lines faced severe challenges, including inadequate supplies, poor nourishment, and even going without pay for months. Captain Strasser witnessed these dire conditions while serving with a unit fighting against the rebels. Valentine Strasser and a group of junior officers became dissatisfied with the dire conditions in Sierra Leone, particularly after Strasser suffered a shrapnel wound that couldn't be promptly treated. They organized a coup and took control of the State House in Freetown, where President Momo's office was located. Although loyal troops briefly reclaimed the State House, the mutineers recaptured it and airlifted President Momo into exile in Guinea. This remarkable feat was achieved by a small group of young soldiers who seized power in the country. Joseph Opala, an American historian familiar with Sierra Leone, was apprehended and sent to the American ambassador to confirm whether the U.S. government would recognize the new regime. Ambassador Johnny Young made an exception due to the lack of democratic elections in the previous government and the dire state of the country. As a result, all political parties were banned and the National Provisional Ruling Council was established as the new government. This led to the dissolution of the parliament. The 1992 Sierra Leonean coup marked the removal of President Joseph Seydou Momo from power by a group of young military officers led by 25-year-old Captain Valentine Strasser on April 29, 1992. Despite his young age, Captain Valentine Strasser took on the unexpected role of leading the nation. During his two-year tenure, he navigated a civil war, survived coup attempts, and faced international criticism for executing adversaries, censoring the media, and conscripting young boys into the army. However, Strasser also implemented positive changes. He supported a two-year transition to democracy, initiated efforts to clean up the capital city, improve tax collection, reduce street crime, 
downsized the civil service, and lowered inflation from 115% to under 15%. As a young leader born after colonial rule, Strasser and his fellow ruling junta members, all in their 20s, were aware of the historical judgment they faced. They were the first African leaders of their generation and carried the weight of that responsibility. We all believe that our actions were for the future, said Major Julius Matabayo, who was 29 years old and served as Strasser's second in command. Despite assuming a position of great responsibility, he admitted that he couldn't say he enjoyed it due to his young age. Strasser and his peers grew up during a time of corrupt dictatorships in the 1970s and 1980s, when the education system deteriorated to the point where students had to take their chairs home to secure a seat in class the next day. After completing high school, Strasser decided to join the army. He came to power in the post-Cold War era when the world's superpower, the United States, could demand democratic governance and free markets in exchange for financial aid. This led many of the 48 sub-Saharan African nations to experiment with representative government, although they faced numerous challenges. It seemed unlikely that Strasser's government would smoothly transition to a democratic model within two years. Nevertheless, the international community provided Strasser with extensive guidance. Nigeria, the largest military dictatorship in Africa, the United States and its allies, and the International Monetary Fund IMF, offered advice and assistance. Strasser accepted the painful conditions of IMF restructuring, which brought certain benefits. Germany financed waste disposal. The British helped with organizing tax collections. Businesses were largely run by ethnic Lebanese individuals, and a council of respected Leonians drafted a proposed constitution that they encouraged Strasser to support. Strasser, known for his trademark attire of sunglasses and barrettes, also received regular counsel from Ghana, a fellow West African nation. In Ghana, Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rawlings had transformed his own young soldier's coup into an electoral victory. Nigeria played a crucial role in assisting Strasser in fighting a rebel war that had disrupted the diamond industry in the southern and eastern regions. Nigerian troops also defended Freetown, including Strasser's own home. The Nigerian dictator, General Sani Abacha had set a negative example for Strasser by overthrowing a civilian government, dissolving elected assemblies, and reversing a decade of economic reforms the previous year. While they had their positive aspects, General Bio, Strasser's second in command, acknowledged that they also had their flaws. However, the young officers, known as the boys, had limited exposure to democracy and the outside world. Dealing with them required great tact, as noted by Tejan Kaba the former manager of the UN Development Program and chairman of the Advisory Council. Bayo, behind his office desk, would sullenly watch as a press aide scolded a reporter for asking inappropriate questions. Kaba, a 62-year-old Oxford-educated individual, revealed that the Advisory Council subtly exerted pressure on the Strasser government without embarrassing them. The council promoted the 170-page draft constitution by putting up posters and slogans in local languages and engaging with villages. The plan aimed for a public referendum on the constitution in May 1995, with the intention of holding multi-party elections in 1996. The council recognized the challenges of promoting democracy in one of the world's poorest nations, where life expectancy was low at 42 years, 86% of the population was illiterate, and infant mortality rates were among the highest. The young people of Sierra Leone, who saw Strasser as one of their own, had endured years of deprivation and repression, which had toughened them. Please like, share, and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Moving on, Paul Kimura, a 36-year-old human rights activist and journalist who had been imprisoned three times by Strasser's predecessor and once by Strasser himself, explained that the harsh conditions of survival over the past 30 years had created a situation where people were focused on staying alive rather than democracy. Strasser actively avoided the press and declined all interview requests. Those who interacted with him regularly noticed his increasing isolation and reduced involvement in daily decision-making. Despite his tendency to be reclusive, Strasser remained popular in Sierra Leone a West African nation with a population of 4.5 million at that time. The country had a unique history, established by freed slaves from Britain, the United States, and Jamaica two centuries ago. 
while Sierra Leone was undeniably beautiful with its pristine ocean beaches and mist-covered mountains, poverty was a significant challenge. European tourists visited the beachfront hotels and enjoyed leisurely walks along the sandy shores. Freetown, the coastal capital, presented a paradox. It was a clean city but disorganized, with colonial-era buildings in various states of decay. The narrow dirt streets were constantly congested and occasionally closed for Strasser's motorcade. Sierra Leone gained independence from Britain in 1961 but experienced a prolonged decline marked by coups and contested elections, resulting in numerous casualties. In 1985, Major General Joseph Momo assumed control, leading the nation into perpetual fuel shortages, food scarcities, and widespread corruption that diverted 90% of the diamond production. In 1991, a rebellion erupted, displacing 1.5 million people from their homes. Momo's inability to pay or feed his soldiers caused discontent among junior officers, who became agitators. By May 1992, the situation had deteriorated to such an extent that the United Nations designated Sierra Leone as the most inhospitable place to live. A few days later, nine junior officers and a convoy of 60 soldiers entered town demanding their pay at gunpoint. Momo, who had become deeply unpopular and had little support left, fled the country. The mutineers, mostly uneducated men from rural villages, approached the charismatic Strasser to lead a provisional military government. Despite the initial instances of human rights violations by his regime, Strasser quickly gained a reputation as a savior among the people, who often overlooked or even celebrated these actions. One of the notable violations during Strasser's regime was the execution of 29 alleged coup plotters on Freetown's beaches without a trial, leading Britain to suspend its aid to Sierra Leone. Although these abuses were eventually brought under control, with Britain resuming its assistance in January, 30 politicians remained under house arrest and around 20 newspapers were still closed. Furthermore, four journalists faced prosecution on sedition charges for reporting allegations from a Swedish newspaper that implicated Strasser and his associates in the illicit diamond trade in Brussels. Despite some small improvements in living conditions, the country experienced little to no economic growth. Investors were hesitant to engage with a nation engulfed in conflict and led by soldiers in their 20s. John Benjamin, the only civilian member of the ruling junta and the sole member over the age of 29, staunchly defended the young government's stability, stating that they had matured and took their roles seriously. He believed they were determined not to fail and were aware of their place in history. However, Strasser's era came to an end in 1996 when he was ousted in another military coup. This time, his fellow members of the NPRC were dissatisfied with his handling of the peace process. Brigadier General Julius Matabio, along with Colonel Tom Yuma and Captain Cambamanda, led the uprising, resulting in Captain Valentine Strasser's removal from power on January 16, 1996. The coup arose from a disagreement within the ruling Supreme Council of State regarding prioritizing peace with the RUF or proceeding with the scheduled multi-party elections in March 1996. The debate during the coup also centered around whether junta members should be allowed to participate in the upcoming elections or be disqualified. Several high-ranking NPRC officers, including Colonel Tom Yuma, Lieutenant Colonel Cambamanda, Lieutenant Colonel Reginald Glover, Lieutenant Colonel Idris Kamara, and Lieutenant Colonel Karefa Cardbo, supported the coup. Captain Valentine Strasser, who was the leader of the NPRC and the military head of state of Sierra Leone at the time, was apprehended at gunpoint by his own military bodyguards, who were responsible for his protection. He was quickly taken into exile in a military helicopter bound for Conakry, the neighboring country of Guinea. After being overthrown, Strasser received a fellowship from the UN to pursue a law degree at the University of Warwick in Coventry, England. However, he discontinued his studies after 18 months. In 2000, Strasser's application for asylum in England was rejected, and his attempt to enter the Gambia was also unsuccessful. Eventually, he returned to Sierra Leone where he lived in poverty and relied on a small pension in Grafton, located east of Freetown. He worked at the ICT Institute, providing computer skills training to young people. In January 2019, he became seriously ill and was taken to Ghana for medical treatment. He had to undergo partial amputation of his left leg due to peripheral artery disease. 
After a period of rehabilitation, Strasser returned to Sierra Leone in July 2021 and was given an apartment by President Bayo. However, allegations arose that the government was keeping him under house arrest, as claimed by Amadou Bakalo Koida, a member of the opposition All People's Congress. Valentine Strasser, who once held the title of the world's youngest head of state, now faced accusations of war crimes. He had ruled Sierra Leone with a legacy of violence from 1992 to 1996 and had been residing in London since 1996. As the youngest head of state at the age of 25, he had cultivated a striking image often seen wearing Ray-Ban sunglasses and designer clothing. Despite criticism of his human rights record from organizations like Amnesty International, the young leader had quickly formed relationships with world leaders including Bill Clinton, John Major, and Nelson Mandela. After only eight months in power, Strasser's armed forces carry out the execution of 26 political opponents on a beach near Freetown. Now that he had lost all power, he had to face the consequences for those actions. The international community was shocked and Britain immediately halted its aid to the country. Amnesty International reported cases of torture against individuals suspected of supporting the rebel group, the Revolutionary United Front, while government soldiers were accused of committing atrocities. By January 1995, the state radio was urging citizens to arm themselves with sticks, stones, and machetes as horrifying accounts of torture, mutilation, and cannibalism emerged from hundreds of people who fled to Freetown. Strasser was removed from power in 1996 and lived a nomadic life in the UK while waiting for a decision on his asylum application. He gave up his studies in law at Warwick University as he had initially entered the country on a student visa. An acquaintance of Strasser in London mentioned that it was still uncertain what his future held as he had support in Sierra Leone and any attempts to bring him back would require careful consideration. Strasser's plea for asylum in the United Kingdom, where he had resided since 1996, was rejected, forcing him to leave the country. As a result, Strasser faced worsening financial struggles without a reliable source of income. During this period, a poignant incident gained widespread attention when he was seen in a public place begging for food. This symbolized his dramatic fall from being a head of state to a state of extreme poverty, capturing the interest of the media and the public. Strasser's life had taken a drastically different direction from his days of extravagant image and leadership style. The images of him seeking food serve as a stark reminder of the challenges faced by leaders who experience a downfall from their once prominent positions, eliciting a mix of compassion and criticism from various sources. Later, President Bayo of Sierra Leone, who had previously ousted Strasser from power, offered him a house to help him overcome significant challenges, including financial difficulties and health issues. The purpose of providing him with this house was to give him a place to live and support him as he tried to rebuild his life and family. Moving into this new residence meant that Strasser had to adapt to a different living situation after returning to Sierra Leone. However, there were allegations that he might have been under house arrest, suggesting that his freedom might have been limited. The specific details of Strasser's life in the house, as arranged by President Bayo, depended on the agreed terms and any restrictions imposed by the government. Considering Strasser's history as the youngest president in history, it is unlikely that he could have extended his rule and stayed in power for decades. His time in office was marked by controversy, and his situation differed from other leaders of that time. It is important to discuss and shed light on topics related to black culture, civilization, and history, which are often overlooked.